This is live from the Vatican. I'm Raymond Arroyo. You hear the bells of St. Peter's chiming behind me. A welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and around the world. The Vatican has just announced the big news of the week, the date of the conclave. The cardinals will file into the Sistine Chapel to select a new pope on Tuesday, March 12th. This is going to be a big week for the Catholic Church and Christians around the world. In our interview segment, we'll talk about the influence of Italy upon this conclave and continuity with Rocco Buttiglione, a former minister in the Italian government and an intimate of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Then we'll acquaint you with the papal Swiss guards. You'll be seeing a lot of them this week. Did Michelangelo really design those bright uniforms? Robert Royal, who wrote the official history of the guard, will tell us later. And we'll be joined by the rest of our conclave crew, Father Roger Landry of the Diocese of Fall River, Massachusetts, and Father Gerald Murray of the Archdiocese of New York. Together, we will introduce you to our first Papabile candidate for Pope. It's a chance to brief you on the men who may well sit on the throne of Peter. Papabile, Papabili, you hear all kinds of things. But first, here's the Daily Dispatch. Today's big news about the date of the conclave, the cardinals have already received their liturgical book for this conclave, the Ordo Ritum Conclavis, or Rites of the Conclave, the 300-page book issued by the Office for the Liturgical Celebrations of the Supreme Pontiff covers everything from the opening mass to the election of the new pope to entering the conclave to the prayers and rites that will be performed inside the Sistine Chapel. In fact, the liturgical book goes all the way to the announcement of the new Roman pontiff in St. Peter's Square. And back in the U.S., three more court decisions came down this week on the HHS mandate, one in favor of religious freedom claims, two others siding with the Obama administration. A district court judge in Missouri has temporarily prevented enforcement of the HHS mandate against a for-profit plumbing supply company owned by a Catholic family. Sioux Chef Manufacturing asked for relief from provisions requiring contraceptive and sterilization coverage in its self-insured health plan. Meanwhile, a district court judge in Texas has dismissed a lawsuit filed by the Diocese of Dallas against the HHS mandate, claiming the case is not yet ripe. In his ruling, the judge directly criticized the administration and its lawyers for their, quote, unimpressive representations that the current regulations will never be enforced, end quote. In a third case, a judge in the District of Columbia has refused to stop the implementation of the HHS mandate against business owners who have sued there. Meanwhile, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops has asked Catholics to offer their fasting and abstinence from meat on March 8th today for all those who fight to preserve religious freedom. The conference is asking Catholics to contact Congress, urging them to support the recently introduced Health Care Conscience Rights Act. And now for our interview segment. He's a former minister in the Berlusconi government, a professor of political science at the St. Pius V University in Rome, and a friend to two popes. Would you welcome Rocco Buttiglione to Live from the Vatican. Rocco, so good to have you here. Good to be here. Great to see you again. Let's talk for a moment because mm -hmm. you are so familiar with the social teaching of John Paul II and, of course, Benedict XVI. Talk to me a little bit about the continuity between those two popes and what that would suggest or portend for the next pope. Well, uh, I think that, first of all, both popes are convinced that um, um, Christian doctrine mm -hmm. is not just a doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, uh, Christian doctrine relies on an event that takes place in history, a force that changes the heart of man mm -hmm. and makes them uh, capable of being more human. So if you do not put in the center the event of Jesus Christ and the capacity of Jesus Christ to transform and change the heart of man, mm -hmm. Uh, then you do not understand the church, but you don't understand even human history and mankind, because through this change of human heart, uh, it becomes possible to create a better society. And here we come to the social teaching. That is uh, not just a, a natural law theory. It is also a natural law theory, of course, sure. but it is, first of all, a meditation on this event. Uh, as what regards uh, uh, the social doctrine, I think, that with John Paul II and Benedict XVI, 
you have had uh, a, um, an understanding also of uh, the characteristics of the American experiment, ah. of the American society, or the American way of life, that goes much deeper than in the past. What do you mean by that? I mean uh, that values like uh, um, the free market economy, mm -hmm. the free enterprise, the mm -hmm. um, responsibility of the individual, um, the value of liberty, mm -hmm. have been put in the center with a greater emphasis than in the past. Mm -hmm. Put in the center, we uh, are not afraid of a society in which man is in the center. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we remember that man discovers his truth, his own truth, the truth of his heart in the face of Jesus Christ and the true his relation to God. If you severe this relation to God, then man uh, is uh, uh, very uh, likely to commit a kind of spiritual suicide. Hmm. We are in the hands of God. Uh, thanks God. If we were in our own hands, we would already be lost. Yeah, I agree. Let's talk about something that we've been uh, hearing from so many of our viewers over the last few days. <coughs> Tell me, you are, you are so familiar with both the church as well as Italian politics. Tell us about the role that the papacy plays in the everyday life of Italians and the role that Italian society plays on the papacy, the pontificate, and this courier. Well, uh, I wish to give you, first of all, a few figures. Okay. Uh, more or less one-third of Italians go to the Mass every week. One-third? One-third. Mm -hmm. Forty-five percent go to the Mass at least one or once or twice in the month. Mm. Uh, Sixteen percent declare that they are Catholics, although not practicing Catholics. You see that almost all Italians, one way or another, uh, accept uh, a, a, a strong relation to Christianity. Are Italians good Catholics? <laughs> no. We are sinners, we have always been, and I... Welcome to the club. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, I thought that the United States, no, you were all uh, full well, of virtue. Well, no, well, let me introduce you to a few people and the guy you're sitting across <laughs> from, but we'll talk about that after well, the show. Of course we are sinners, but, uh, but uh, when you come to what really matters in life, uh, to uh, the fact of falling in love, what shall mm -hmm. I do? Mm -hmm. ha uh, having children, mm -hmm. what do I wish for my children? Um, mm -hmm. Suffering the, uh, the death of a beloved person or facing your own death, then uh, Italians um, rediscover uh, their uh, Catholic uh, foundations. Mm -hmm. And so the word of the church is always important as a moral orientation for all the country, even for those who uh, don't go to Mass or who mm -hmm. think they are not Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, because this is the tradition in which we have been raised, uh, in which uh, uh, our parents have found the strength of character yeah. to lead their lives and uh, allow us to become what we are. Well, and as you said before the interview, we were talking, you said, well, he is the Bishop of Rome, Raymond. Of course, so, he's the Bishop of Rome. So and, he, and must be, he must have a role mm -hmm. in, uh, in Italy. This does not mean that the Pope interferes with Italian politics. Mm -hmm. uh, this was never the case, at least not as much as in America. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, with these two last Popes who were not Italians, mm -hmm. much less. Yeah. The effect is the effect of teaching and moral example. Rocco, we hear stories about this Curia, and the cardinals, even those I've spoken with, said the Curia needs reform. We need to get a governor and someone who will go dicastery by dicastery, office by office, and reform what is here. From your perspective, living here, being here, what ails this Curia now? And do you think a reformer is in the cards? Well. Um, I don't know the Curia very well, so I suppose that when they say that a, a reform of the Curia is needed, they are right. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, more important than the reform of the Curia, the structural reform, is an interior reform. Um, the Church mm -hmm. needs to have in the Curia uh, people who are men of faith, who believe in God and in the presence of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. who give a good example. And um, the Church is poor. Most people don't believe it. Of course, the church has sure. important, uh, um, sure. important wealth to mm -hmm. its disposal. But with this wealth, the church supports works of charity throughout the world. Um, for those who are, have not uh, the fortune of being born in the United States or in Europe, mm -hmm. um, health uh, support mm -hmm. comes mostly from 
uh, church institutions. Yeah. We have an, a, an enormous network mm -hmm. of hospitals in the world, for instance. Right. And the, the results of the church are very small if you compare them with the demands of the poor right. uh, in the world mm -hmm. that the church is willing to satisfy. Mm -hmm. So it is a great scandal to see men of the church who lead a life like a, a, a rich man, like a wealthy mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. Or it is a ter terrible scandal uh, if uh, the money of the church is mismanaged for private purposes and not for uh, the institutional um, end. So before we run out of time, who would you like to see? Not the name, but what type of man would you like to see on the throne of Peter, given your knowledge both of Italy and being so proximate here to the Holy See? Well, um, I, of course, hope to see a man who continues along the path of John Paul II and of Joseph Ratzinger, mm -hmm. uh, of Benedict XVI. So a man who has this strong Christocentric um, vision, mm -hmm. Christ mm -hmm. in the center. A man who loves the Council Vatican II mm -hmm. and at the same time considers the Council as a moment in the life of the Church, mm -hmm. not a break in the mm -hmm. church history, mm -hmm. but as a moment in which, of course, there are elements of innovation, sure. but also fundamental elements of continuity. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, well, in addition to this, we have had a pope who was a prophet, John Paul II. We have had a pope who was a doctor of the church, mm -hmm. Ratzinger. Now we need also a man who has administrative capabilities and can put in order also the administration of the church. In a moment, we're going to introduce our audience to Cardinal Angelo Scola uh, of Milan, whom I know you've been friends with for decades. Uh, tell me about him, his background. I know he was a member of that uh, Comunio Theological uh, uh, School founded by uh, Joseph Ratzinger. He also was a member of Communion and Liberation, which you have some familiarity. How will all of that affect him? How has it affected his spirituality? Well. I think that, first of all, uh, Angelo Scola uh, is a disciple of Don Luigi Giussani, the founder of Comunione Liberazione. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, the beginning, Comunione Liberazione was uh, a company of people, mostly young people, mm -hmm. whose life had been changed by the encounter with Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, later, there have been many developments to which uh, uh, Angelo Scola did not participate. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, he is one of the founders, one of the first years mm. of the movement. It was an extraordinary experience of um, human liberation. The presence of God in your life, the presence of Christ in your life, creates the possibility of a friendship that is stronger than any human friendship and creates the possibility of making, a, making an experience of a profoundly renewed humanity. Mm. Um, this has grown in the dialogue with uh, uh, Ansulz von Balthasar yes. and Josef Ratzinger. Both uh, were among the founders of Comunio mm. and both were friends of Don Giussani. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when Comunio was founded, there were some um, great German theologians mm -hmm. uh, von Balthasar, uh, uh, Ratzinger, mm -hmm. uh, some great French theologians, the Lubac, yeah. um, and uh, uh, a few uh, Italian uh -huh. uh, uh, young boys, al almost uh -huh. boys. Uh, Angelo Scola, Luigi uh -huh. Negri, uh, uh, Santi Bagnoli, and even myself. And you, yeah. Rocco Bugliani. Somewhere Bugliani. in the neighborhood. Thank you so much for being here. We hope to You're talk well. to you in the days ahead. God bless. Great to see you. When Live from the Vatican continues, just who are those brightly clad Swiss guards? And what will their role be in this conclave? Robert Royal has some answers. And Fathers Landry and Murray will be here as well to introduce you to Angelo Cardinal Scola, our first papabile Papabili. I keep saying Papabili. Papabili candidate. I'll get it right when they have a new pope. More from Vatican City in a moment. Stay right there. back to live from the Vatican. The Swiss Guard are a permanent fixture here at the Holy See, whether a pope's on the throne or not. But who are these men and how do they come to be here? Take a look. Yes, first of all, you need to be a practicing Catholic. Uh, you need to be uh, between 19 and 30 years old, single. 
And uh, the minimum height is one, met, one meter and 74. You have to, uh, you need a good reputation from the parish and also from the civil part of the state. And uh, also uh, absolve an apprenticeship or otherwise the diploma. And we also did the basic training of the Swiss Army. You have to be in good physical and psychological health. And once you have all these requirements, uh, you can enter to the GALT. The Swiss Guard, that is. It's one of the most exclusive military units in the world. The Pope's very own army. Our motto is uh, courage and fidelity. Since 505 years, we are here to serve the Holy Father and his successor. Uh, in the past, we were mercenaries. Now the Swiss uh, soldier is a very modern, formed Swiss citizen serving here to the Holy See. They've been here in the Vatican in one way or another since they were first employed by Pope Julius II back in 1506. This tradition runs deep. This armour, for example, dates back to their earliest days. There are currently 110 men serving. Most, like these two, are carrying out their 25-month service. They serve at posts throughout the Vatican, at gates and also within the Pope's residence. To live here in the Vatican means to have a big uh, privilege, to live in the centre of Rome, to live underneath the Pope's apartment. And uh, in this little community, we are uh, living in the same uh, barracks, we are eating together, go in duty together. It's definitely a big uh, privilege to serve the Pope, as I uh, knew, as I served to John Paul II during his last seven uh, years of life and also this Pope uh, Benedict so it's uh, it's very great it's fantastic it's fabulous to serve them in a such a directly way and to guarantee the security and once you're in it's for life I retain that Swiss to be a Swiss guard is uh, still a vocation once you are a Swiss guard you still remain a Swiss guard till the end of your life and that's what makes still our uh, service uh, an ex uh, experience for the whole life. Joining me back on set is author of The Pope's Army, 500 years of the Papal Swiss Guard, and a member of our panel, Robert Royal. Now, Robert, you have been, I know, exploring with the Swiss what they'll be dur doing during this conclave. People have been emailing us, what are the, why are the Swiss running around? I thought they only protected the Pope. What did you discover today? Well, first of all, I discovered that they don't want to do any interviews until we have, <laughs> we have the Like everybody else in this town, nobody wants to talk until we have a Pope. To talk. But um, there's, like the rest of what's happening right now, there's continuity. Mm -hmm. They're expecting that once we get into the conclave, it's going to proceed as usual. Mm -hmm. But as some, I think, of the, uh, the uh, viewers have asked, what are they doing guarding the cardinals? Well, they, they normally do that in the inter, interregnum anyway. Mm -hmm. Now, by guarding, they mean when they're on site here and they're talking, they're going to events, when they're in, the, in St. Peter's uh, Basilica. Yeah. They aren't sending out, because there are 115 cardinal electors, they aren't sending out a Swiss guard every night with, you know, go to with dinner each cardinal. With, each, with each cardinal. So there's continuity. They've, I, I, detected great confidence and orderliness, as you might expect from the Swiss, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's, it's moving along. Very good. Today there was a little announcement about how the Cardinal's rooms at the Doma Sancta Marta, that's the Vatican hotel that sits at the heart of Vatican City, where the Cardinals will be staying. Now, at the press conference today it was announced that they will draw lots to determine who exactly will reside where. I want to welcome Father Landry and Father Murray aboard here. Tell me for a moment, what does this indicate to you briefly? This indicates that they want to have a certain type of fairness to prevent some cliques forming naturally and if everybody were to have squatters rights for their individual room this is going to hopefully providentially form some conversations that may not have occurred elsewhere but there are no favorites on seniority or anything else everybody enters on in an equal mm -hmm. and that's a pretty good thing 
I want to move to Cardinal Angelo Scola, who we want to introduce the audience to. He is uh, the Archbishop of Milan. He is a favorite of Benedict XVI. They were very close. Uh, in fact, when, uh, when the Cardinal of Milan, when, when uh, Scola was granted his new see, when he was made Archbishop, Pope Benedict welcomed him at Castel Gandolfo and placed the, the pallium, which is sort of that woolen collar, a sign of his authority, upon him personally. That is normally done here at St. Peter's. So that was seen by some as sort of a tell that maybe Cardinal Scola had an upper hand here. Now, he was rector at the Lateran University. He has also started something called the Oasis Project to help Christians in the Middle East. And he spearheaded a dialogue with the Muslim world just to give you a sense of the man. Here's a clip of an interview I conducted with him several years ago. He discusses his humble background here. Listen. You are the son of a truck driver and a homemaker, something you've made no excuses for. In fact, it really is something that you're quite proud of. How has that shaped your ministry? I think, above all, <clears throat> in giving me a very deep sense of the people, to stay among the people, to to live with them and to perceive uh, the experience of life by the people. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the great tradition of the Catholic Church uh, has always uh, strong uh, understrike uh, this attitude when the church speak about the census fide the, the the sense of the faith which is owned by the people of god so uh, for me uh, my roots in my family very humble but so uh, uh, capable capable of love and truth uh, help me very much uh, in my pastoral career. Father Murray, I want you to talk about the background, Cardinal Scola's background. I mean, it's, it's, it's so nice to hear one of these papal candidates from another country, from Italy, speaking in English, first of all, for our audience anyway. Well, he uh, comes from a modest family. His father was a truck driver, mm -hmm. but his uh, academic uh, career in Catholic schools is one of the, I could say, glories of the Catholic Church. People mm -hmm. who are smart, doesn't matter whether they come from wealth or not, they're given an opportunity to rise to the highest intellectual level. He's also a man, we could say, who has uh, used his energy to promote the good of the Church, both intellectually and pastorally. And I think that reflects what he experienced as a young man. Uh, his writings are very important, but his example as bishop in Grosseto, uh, then in Venice and Milan, he takes a very serious interest in the spiritual welfare of the people. Yeah. Now, Father Landry, you studied under Cardinal Scola. Tell me what that experience was like, and what did you experience personally? Did any indications to his personal feelings, the type of man he is, his character? He's a totally brilliant thinker. A little bit hard to follow in the classroom, to be honest, uh -huh. because he could cover so many topics in the very same sentence. Oh boy. So it was hard to take notes from him, but... That's like I, sitting next to you, but go ahead. I know you study. But. <laughs> Every class was like a course. That's how much ground he covered. Uh -huh. But one of the things that I'll always remember about Cardinal Scholar is I had an exam with a professor in which I thought the professor was unjust and giving me no credit for something because he disagreed with John Paul II. Mm. And I was able to persuade the professor to give me a retake on that exam. Uh -huh. As history would happen, he dies the next day on a Roman street. Oh and God. I go to the one who was running the ladder and the secretary, it's called, who's in charge of the day-to-day -day stuff. And I told him about the conversation I had with this priest who had died. He said, how do I know you're not lying? And I said, well, I'm a Roman Catholic priest. I would rather get a bad grade than to lie. He said, well, we're not going to do anything. So I went to see, uh, now Cardinal Scholar was the rector. I told him the story. He got on the phone, immediately called down and said, we're going to take this priest's word for it. Mm. He's a man of real justice. And I've never forgotten that, that mm. when you're powerful and you're able to help out little guys, yeah. um, God remembers. And that's how you see the mark of a man. That's interesting. Why do you think we're hearing so much about Cardinal Angelo Scola this week? 
I'll start with I you, think Father because Mark. he was a close associate of Pope Benedict and also of Pope John Paul II. Mm -hmm. uh, he was at the Institute for Marriage and Family at the latter, and that was one of the most mm -hmm. important uh, initiatives of Pope John Paul II. Uh, he also comes from a very important see. Uh, of the last three Italian popes, they came either from Venice or Milan. He was Archbishop of both. Huh. He is a very viable candidate for the pontificate. Okay. Rob, I keep hearing he is a nice compromise between those who want reform in the Curia and those who are looking for an Italian to kind of stabilize things here in Italy. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think that he brings together a lot of the qualities that people have been mentioning for the next pope. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, his brilliance is, is in the line of, of John Paul II and Ratzinger. But as Rocco mm -hmm. Buttiglione was talking about uh, as well, it's hard to know how to get a grip on the, on the Curia, I think, from the outside. So he's close enough in to know what needs to be done, but maybe not close, so close that he's been drawn into it himself. And mm -hmm. he's really shown a great deal of dynamism in, in this, this Muslim dialogue up in Venice. Yes, he has. In his life, uh, his earlier life, as Rocco was talking about. So you, you can't help but think that he's a very strong candidate uh, for all the reasons that people have been talking about, mm -hmm. that, that we want to choose someone that touches a number of different bases yes. as we go forward. Clearly, there was some concern um, on Pope Benedict's part at the end of November of last year when he had that last consistory where he named all these new cardinals. None of them were from Europe and one was Tagal from, uh, Tagale from, from the Philippines. Uh, others came from various parts of the world but not from Europe. Was that a correction? Is he indicating there that perhaps you don't need an Italian pope? Pope Benedict himself said that it was the continuation of a conclave last February in which there were many Italians and many members of the Curia. And so he appointed an American, one from the Philippines, one from South America, one from Africa, and two from Asia, from these Catholic Syro uh, Mal Mal Malabar and Syro Malab Malabrisi rites to diversify the College of Cardinals and basically re remind everyone that we are a Catholic Church, mm -hmm. which means universal, represented all over. One of the things that happened during Benedict's pontificate is in the last eight years where we had 20 Italian electoral cardinal electors in 2005, now we have 28. So we wanted to remedy okay. that. We're going to leave it there. I'd love to come back to Father Murray, but I'll get you tomorrow, I Very promise. Good. We're out of town. Before, we're out of time, not out of town. Before we go, remember, my Rome diary can be found at RaymondArroyo.com as well as on my seen and unseen blog at EWTN.com. Each day I bring you the unvarnished insider take on these important days in Rome. That's all the time we have. Remember to join us tomorrow at 2 p.m. and again at 9 p.m. Eastern time in the United States at least through the election of a new pope tomorrow I think we're gonna have an hour-long show so we'll get a lot of other candidates in that I think the Cardinals are looking at we will continue to bring you the most authoritative and we hope engaging coverage of this event that you can find anywhere the show continues on Facebook and Twitter go to my Twitter and Facebook accounts you can find them easily out there on the internet and we continue to take your questions at conclave at EWTN.com sorry for that hiccup on my prompter. On behalf of Father Landry, Father Murray, Robert Royal, and the entire staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Buona sera from Rome. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye now. And I'm Doug Keck, and welcome back to EWTN Studios, uh, where we just saw the end of Live from the Vatican with Raymond Arroyo and his team. And big news today, uh, the conclave has been announced beginning Tuesday, March 12th, so look for that. We've got the conclave beginning then. Starting things off in the morning will be Holy Mass for the election of the Supreme Pontiff. That's in the morning. And then the procession of the cardinal electors to the Sistine Chapel. Now that will be in the afternoon in Rome. And of course, in Eastern time zone, all of this will be happening earlier in the morning. For more information, just go to our, our website, EW10.com. And stay with us all weekend as we have a full lineup of shows, including our EW10 Vatican Daily Program with Colleen Carroll Campbell. Look for it at 9 a.m. Eastern. Again, encoring each day at 5 p.m. Eastern. And we've got our EWTN radio show that's running as well. That's with Tom Price and Elena Rodriguez. Check that out. And then, of course, uh, the program we just had 
which was live from the Vatican tomorrow at 2 p.m. And a special edition. I told you it had not gone away. Rome Dispatch with Joan Lewis. And you can look for that coming up this weekend. And again, you should check out uh, all this information for the latest, greatest information on our website, EWTN.com. And while you're there, download our free EWTN app for iPhone, iPad, and now for Android. Yes, it's available. Check us out live streaming on our website, as I said. And of course, you can always watch us on Roku and on YouTube if you're not watching us via satellite or on your local cable system. And you can also follow us on Twitter at hashtag EWTN from Rome, one word all together there. And we'd love you to like us on Facebook, especially with Mother's Birthday coming up. And more coverage, of course, every day at the website of ncregister.com. So I have a complete schedule all coming your way uh, later today. We still have replays of our programs. And of course, this weekend, stay with us as we cover everything right now through the beginning of the conclave till we have the white smoke, until we have a new Holy Father installed. I'm Doug Heck. Stay with us here at EWTN.